Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother, Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. We love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for June 29th through July 5th, 2020. This is covering Alma, chapters 23 to 29. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Oh, I'm so excited to see what you have in store. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 43 minutes, 38 seconds. Oh, all right. Well, at first that may seem like a lot, but remember, that's not even as long as one episode of the Great British Baking Show. That's true. So you can watch the patisserie episode later. You can stream that later. But this time we're going to feast upon the word. Ah, I see what you did there. See, it was a, it was a. Now, for those of you who have gotten used to the idea of reading a little bit every day, that would be just a little over six minutes. Six minutes, fourteen seconds. Excellent. Now, this one we're covering a lot of chapters today, so here are some time codes, and they will also be linked in the description down below. Right. And now let's get to it. Chapter twenty-three. Now we left off last week. And Lamoni, of course, had his great conversion experience with Ammon. And the king of the Lamanites, his father, also has a wonderful experience with Aaron and is now converted to the gospel. So we start out in chapter 23. Behold, now it came to pass that the king of the Lamanites sent a proclamation among all his people that they should not lay their hands on Ammon or Aaron or Omner or Himna, nor either of their brethren who should go forth preaching the word of God in whatsoever place they should be in any part of their land. Yea, he sent a decree among them that they should not lay their hands on them to bind them or to cast them into prison, neither should they spit upon them nor smite them, nor cast them out of their synagogues, nor scourge them, neither should they cast stones at them, but that they should have free access to their houses and also their temples and their sanctuaries, and this that they might go forth and preach the word according to their desires. For the king had been converted unto the Lord and all his household. Therefore he sent his proclamation throughout the land unto his people, that the word of God might have no obstruction, but that it might go forth throughout all the land, that his people might be convinced concerning the wicked traditions of their fathers, and that they might be convinced that they were all brethren, and that they ought not to murder, nor to plunder, nor to steal, nor to commit adultery, nor to commit any manner of wickedness. I love the idea that he's not forcing his kingdom to join the church. He's just removing any obstacles so that they could hear the message, at least give the message a chance, which is really wonderful. But look at the effects that we have here, too, uh, in verse 3 here at the end. One of the effects of letting people listen to the message is that they might believe and understand that they are all brethren. What a great message. We are all children of God. And that's the first thing he mentions. Think about what that does when we can all realize that. And then once they do, then of course they're not going to murder or plunder or steal or commit adultery or commit any manner of wickedness. Think of the kind of citizens you're creating. What, however you feel about the king you know, wanting to promote this particular message, it's going to improve everybody in the kingdom. So that's pretty great. Yeah, and I think that the king knew that. I mean, I think this goes beyond, he was converted, certainly. Yeah. But I think this goes beyond just a spiritual conversion. Hey, you guys need to listen to this so that you can be converted too. I think actually from a political perspective, he understands that if people listen to this message, regardless of whether they're converted to the gospel, it will teach them to be better people and to manage themselves better. And every government needs that, needs that moral help. And I think he recognized that. Absolutely. 
From the Institute Manual, there's a story that we're going to kind of trim a little bit from April 1989 General Conference from President Thomas S. Monson that kind of illustrates this point. It talks about the circumstances surrounding the decision made by the government of the German Democratic Republic to allow missionaries to preach in that land after years of restricted church activity. Germany has not historically had a lot of support for the restored church. And this was a very significant event. He says, quote, Chairman Honecker began, We know members of your church believe in work. You've proven that. We know you believe in the family. You've demonstrated that. We know you are good citizens in whatever country you claim as home. We have observed that. The floor is yours. Make your desires known. President Monson described the thousands of people that have visited the temple grounds and the open houses and said, we cannot answer questions and we cannot convey our feelings because we have no missionary representatives here as we do in other countries. The young men and young women whom we would like to have come to your country as missionary representatives would love your nation and your people, more particularly, they would leave an influence with your people which would be ennobling. Then we would like to see young men and young women from your nation who are members of our church serve as missionary representatives in many nations, such as in America, in Canada, and in a host of others. They will return better prepared to assume positions of responsibility in your land. Chairman Honecker smiled and addressed me and the group, saying, we know you, we trust you, we have had experience with you. Your missionary request is approved. My spirit soared out of the room. The black darkness of night had ended. The bright light of day had dawned. The gospel of Jesus Christ would now be carried to the millions of people in that nation. Their questions concerning the church will be answered and the kingdom of God will go forth, end quote. What a wonderful story. That's beautiful. And it's a powerful message to all of us that this was accomplished because of the examples of the members of the church. Yep. That's great. Yeah, just like we've seen here, the examples of Ammon, Aaron, their brethren, and those that joined the church. Yeah, and there's a growing number of examples now. So verse 5 and thousands were brought to the knowledge of the Lord. Yea, thousands were brought to believe in the traditions of the Nephites, and they were taught the records and prophecies which were handed down even to the present time. And as sure as the Lord liveth, so sure as many as believed, or as many as were brought to the knowledge of the truth, through the preaching of Ammon and his brethren, according to the spirit of revelation and of prophecy, and the power of God working miracles in them. Yea, I say unto you, as the Lord liveth, as many of the Lamanites as believed in their preaching and were converted unto the Lord, never did fall away. Wow. Yeah, that's very powerful. Can you kind of hear Mormon as he's telling us this story, the kind of excitement, He makes enthusiasm? it clear what he wants to emphasize. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's so proud of these people. He's so excited for them. Well, and who could blame him? Absolutely. What a great example. Again, this is an unprecedented success story from the very beginning of the Book of Mormon. Yeah. We are 500 plus years into the history of Lehi's descendants and nothing like this has ever happened. Yeah, it's miraculous. So here in the next few verses, the Lamanites are converted in the land of Ishmael, in the land of Madoni, the city of Nephi, the land of Shilom, the city of Shemlon. You remember those, Shilom and Shemlon? Yeah. Back in the days of Zenith and King Noah? Yeah. And the city of Shemnilam. But the Amalekites are not converted except one. Who is that guy? That's kind of mysterious, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I guess we're never really going to know. I don't think they ever name who this was, but he was an Amalekite who had converted, which is pretty impressive if you think about it. I guess. He but was one that was likely raised as a Nephite, yeah. uh, dissented from the Nephites, and then returned. How rare is that? Yeah. 
Well, in, in the Book of Mormon right now, it is. The only time we're going to have any major number of conversions of dissenters is going to be in Helaman 5, and so we'll have to wait a little while for that. But right. otherwise, no luck. Well, and we talked about the Amalekites, but he also specifies that the Amulonites, none of them were converted. Now, these are the descendants of the priests of Noah, as you'll recall. Yeah, remarkable. So going on, verse 16, And it came to pass that the king and those who were converted were desirous that they might have a name, that thereby they might be distinguished from their brethren. So that's interesting. They want to have a different name for their group. They're not content to be called Lamanites. Yeah, that's interesting. Therefore, the king consulted with Aaron and many of their priests concerning the name that they should take upon them, that they might be distinguished. And it came to pass that they called their names Anti-Nephi-Lehi's. And they were called by this name and were no more called Lamanites. And they began to be a very industrious people. Yea, and they were friendly with the Nephites. Therefore, they did open a correspondence with them. And the curse of God did no more follow them. Well, there's some interesting stuff here for sure. Indeed. Uh, starting at the end, this notion of the curse did no more follow them. Remember what we've learned throughout the Book of Mormon that a curse is. It's a separation from God because of wickedness. We first get that idea, and at least the first place I'm familiar with is 2 Nephi 5.20. And Alma 3.19 helped us to understand that each man brings upon himself his own condemnation. We believe that men will be punished for their own sins, not for Adam's transgression. So... Of course, the curse did follow them no more. They had turned to the Lord. So that's really awesome. And it's a great reminder to each of us. Also, the word anti in anti-Nephi-Lehi's, there's a few different theories about what that means. And I'll tell you that I'm not quite sure where I fall on these various theories. First of all, I had people say, well, you know, anti actually in, in Egyptian something something means, you know, that you're for. And I thought, well, OK, but one of the things I like to do when I'm looking at words I don't understand is how does the book itself use it? And the Book of Mormon uses anti meaning against, just like we do in like the word antichrist. So that doesn't work for me unless, and actually this is something that my 16-year-old pointed out to me, Ethan said, you know, Dad, that's a proper name. And so it probably was translated directly rather than it being interpreted, you know, a translation of the word as opposed to... A transliteration. Right. So it would be called a transliteration in the same way you don't translate a name like Nephi. You just transliterate it, that you just give what's in the text. So since this is a proper name, that may fall outside of that notion. It, maybe it's not a translated word, in which case there are some other uh, ideas that might help us understand what that means. Certainly, it's a point to ponder. The prefix anti is from Greek, and certainly the Greek nation was barely surfacing at the time Lehi left Jerusalem. So I don't know how much that would have permeated their culture. Well, as a proper name. Well, true. But what we're getting at here is that if it is a translated word, it's certainly not an anachronism because it's already used in terms like Antichrist. Yeah. But there have been those that have suggested, again, that this might relate to the Egyptian prefix ntai, which would mean for or representing there is a Book of Mormon central know why, number 131, that goes into more detail about this if you want to read about it. The fact of the matter is, here again, we don't really know, but it's interesting to speculate. Well, you know what I'd be excited about with this is if it was translated and it was anti, then what it may mean is the lands in which the Lamanites live are the land of Lehi and the land of Nephi. Um, traditionally, the Lamanites were in the land of Lehi, the Nephites were in Nephi, and then they left, and so the Lamanites took over both of those. So it might be one way of saying, look, we reject the tradition of our land. If, however, it's transliterated, and it means we're for something, for Lehi and Nephi, then one of the things I really love about, I hope that's the answer, I hope that's the one, because I love the idea of them thinking, you know what, if we could go back in time in 2 Nephi chapter 5, we would have picked Nephi. 
we would have left with Nephi. We would have gone with him. And that's mm. just a great image. I love that they might think like that. Well, it's an interesting point to ponder, and we encourage it, certainly. So let's go on to chapter 24. So the Amalekites and the Amulonites and unconverted Lamanites, because they didn't all get converted, right? A lot of them did. Mm -hmm. And these people were in Helam and Jerusalem and, quote, in all the land round about. They're stirred up to anger against the anti-Nephi-Lehi's. They secede from the kingdom and declare war on them. So the rest of the Lamanites and the Amalekites and Amulonites, they didn't take this so well. No, and it's not just that it's a religious uprising. It's a cultural change, and it's even a political yeah. change. Right. And that could be the, the whole source of it, really. I mean, we know that the Amulonites in the past were pretty conniving, and if the Amalekites were, in fact, the Amlicites, we know them to be very clever. Yeah. They could be seeing this as an opportunity to seize power. Yeah, absolutely. So in verses 3 and 4, some significant things there. The Lamanite king confers his kingship to his son, who he has named Anti-Nephi-Lehi. And I wonder if that might be another king title type of thing, because we know that Nephi was a king title. The Laman apparently the seemed to be. Laman seemed to be a king yeah. title as well. So perhaps he's starting a new tradition here and that this yeah. is a king title, anti-Nephi Lehi. That's a cool idea. Well, and then he dies in that same year as the Amalekites, Amulonites, and the rest of the Lamanites prepare for war. He has lived a very full life, but we are glad to see that he found the gospel at least before he passed away. And made such a difference in his kingdom. Amazing. He did. Amazing. And so now we get anti-Nephi-Lehi's speech to his people. And I don't want to read the whole speech, but in verse 6, it says, Now there was not one soul among all the people who had been converted unto the Lord that would take up arms against their brethren. Nay, they would not even make any preparations for war. Yea, and also their king commanded them that they should not. So in the next few verses, he expresses deeply his gratitude for the sons of Mosiah, for the Spirit, for being convinced of their sins and the opportunity to repent. Mm. This drew attention to a really good quote from the Institute Manual. President Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve during April 2001 General Conference said, quote, For some reason, we think the atonement of Christ applies only at the end of mortal life to redemption from the fall, from spiritual death. It is much more than that. It is an ever-present power to call upon in everyday life when we are racked or harrowed up or tormented by guilt or burdened with grief. He can heal us. While we do not fully understand how the atonement of Christ was made, we can experience the peace of God which passeth all understanding. We all make mistakes. Sometimes we harm ourselves and seriously injure others in ways that we alone cannot repair. We break things that we alone cannot fix. It is then in our nature to feel guilt and humiliation and suffering, which we alone cannot cure. That is when the healing power of the atonement will help. The Lord said, Behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. The atonement has practical, personal, everyday value. Apply it in your life. It can be activated with so simple a beginning as prayer. You will not thereafter be free from trouble and mistakes, but can erase the guilt through repentance and be at peace, end quote. That certainly kind of embodies the attitude of the people at this time. They recognize all that they had done and all of their misbehaviors before they had become converted. Yeah. But they recognize the power of Jesus Christ, yeah, these... who, by the way, has still not come. Yeah. Mortality. And you know, yet... There's still, you know, that doesn't diminish the power of Christ in these people's lives. No. And, you know, these people have the best perspective they really do. And the way they look at their brethren, you remember earlier we read about 
how by preaching the gospel, it would help them to esteem everyone as their brothers. And these guys got that message better than most. Indeed. So here's the last part of King Anti-Nephi-Lehi's speech. Verse 14. And the great God has had mercy on us and made these things known unto us that we might not perish. Yea, and he has made these things known unto us beforehand, because he loveth our souls as well as he loveth our children. Therefore, in his mercy, he doth visit us by his angels, that the plan of salvation might be made known unto us as well as unto future generations. Oh, how merciful is our God! And now behold, since it has been as much as we could do to get our stains taken away from us, and our swords are made bright, let us hide them away, that they may be kept bright as a testimony to our God at the last day, or at the day that we shall be brought to stand before him to be judged, that we have not stained our swords in the blood of our brethren, since he imparted his word unto us and has made us clean thereby. And now, my brethren, if our brethren seek to destroy us, Behold, we will hide away our swords. Yea, even we will bury them deep in the earth, that they may be kept bright as a testimony that we have never used them at the last day. And if our brethren destroy us, behold, we shall go to our God and shall be saved. And now it came to pass that when the king had made an end of these sayings and all the people were assembled together, they took their swords and all the weapons which were used for the shedding of man's blood, and they did bury them up deep in the earth. And this they did, it being in their view a testimony to God and also to men that they never would use weapons again for the shedding of man's blood. And this they did, vouching and covenanting with God that rather than shed the blood of their brethren... They would give up their own lives, and rather than take away from a brother, they would give unto him. And rather than spend their days in idleness, they would labor abundantly with their hands. And thus we see that when these Lamanites were brought to believe and to know the truth, they were firm and would suffer even unto death rather than commit sin. And thus we see that they buried their weapons of peace or they buried their weapons of war for peace. One of the messages that I take from that, and I love Anti-Nephi-Lehi's speech, this idea that they would give up their lives, they would give rather than take. This is at the end of verse 18. They would give to their brother rather than take away from a brother. They would rather spend their days creating than in idleness or consuming You know, these are people who want to give to the world rather than be people that take or people that are consumers or idle, instead builders of things. And that's what the gospel does. It puts us in touch with that divine part of our nature, which is to be creators in embryo. We are little creators. From the Institute Manual, there is a great quote from President Spencer W. Kimball from his book, The Miracle of Forgiveness. He says, quote, In abandoning sin, one cannot merely wish for better conditions. He must make them. He must be certain not only that he has abandoned the sin, but that he has changed the situations surrounding the sin. He should avoid the places and conditions and circumstances where the sin occurred, for these could most readily breed it again. He must eliminate anything which would stir the old memories, end quote. And that's certainly what these people did. Good advice. You know, it reminded me, this story, of a recent general conference talk back in the fall in October 2019. Dale G. Renlin talked about casting of idols into a raging waterfall. But to the very end of his talk, he says, quote, I invite you to commit a lifelong process of discipleship. Make and keep covenants. Throw your old ways into deep churning waterfalls. Completely bury your weapons of rebellion with no handles sticking out. Because of the atonement of Jesus Christ, 
making covenants with a real intent to reliably honor them will bless your life forever. You will become more like the Savior as you always remember him, follow him, and adore him, end quote. Amen to that. Great admonition. Yeah. I love that image of bearing your weapons, but not with a handle sticking out so you can grab it later. (laughs) Well, isn't that a great phrase that Antony Felihi uses, deep in the earth? Right. They've made it clear that that this is... Yeah. Yeah. They're not going to be able to retrieve these easily. Yep. No, I, that's, what a great attitude. I, I want that. I know that in aspects of my life, I've achieved that with certain things, but I still have plenty of things in which I'm not there yet. But I, uh, hallelujah, with this idea of it being a lifelong process of discipleship. Keep doing it. Keep digging the hole. Be ready to throw in your weapons of rebellion. Well, let's take a look at what happens. Keep in mind that at this point where all of this is going on, They've been with the Lamanites now for 11 years. and These are the sons of Mosiah. The sons of Mosiah, right, have been on their mission for 11 years. Now, we know that from Alma 16 that they're on their mission for 14 years total. So they're getting toward the end of what's going to happen here. We know, by the way, they've been out for 11 years because of the events that are about to happen correlate with events in Alma 16.9. In verse 20... It says, it came to pass that their brethren, the Lamanites, made preparations for war. I also like that they buried their weapons, not when they were converted, but at the first sign of possibly being tempted to break their covenant, you know, as they saw it. So as soon as they were making preparations to come to war, that's when they buried their weapons. So they came up to the land of Nephi for the purpose of destroying the king. That appears to be the primary thing. Get rid of the king. We're going to put things back the way they were. And to place another in his stead. And also of destroying the people of anti-Nephi-Lehi out of the land. Now, when the people saw that they were coming against them, they went out to meet them and prostrated themselves before them to the earth and began to call on the name of the Lord. And thus, they were in this attitude when the Lamanites began to fall upon them and began to slay them with the sword. And thus, without meeting any resistance, they did slay a thousand and five of them. And we know that they are blessed, for they have gone to dwell with their God. Now, when the Lamanites saw that their brethren would not flee from the sword, neither would they turn aside to the right hand or to the left, but that they would lie down and perish and praised God even in the very act of perishing under the sword? Now, when the Lamanites saw this, they did forbear from slaying them. And there were many whose hearts had swollen in them for those of their brethren who had fallen under the sword, for they repented of the things which they had done. And it came to pass that they threw down their weapons of war, and they would not take them again. For they were stung for the murders which they had committed, And they came down, even as their brethren, relying upon the mercies of those whose arms were lifted to slay them. And it came to pass that the people of God were joined that day by more than the number who had been slain. And those who had been slain were righteous people. Therefore, we have no reason to doubt, but that they were saved. And there was not a wicked man slain among them. But there were more than a thousand brought to the knowledge of the truth. Thus we see that the Lord worketh in many ways to the salvation of his people. This is certainly an unusual way to work for the salvation of his people, a strange way to bring people into the church. Just paint this picture a little bit. These men, and I'm going to call them men because it says brethren, which means that the women and the children are watching this happen? Are they in their homes waiting to hear the news about who's coming home and who's not? What about King Lamoni? We don't ever hear of him again at this point. Was he one of the ones that died or not? I hope it wasn't. But this was really horrible. And it had such a powerful effect on many of them that they joined the church. What a remarkable How do you go to the family, like maybe you just killed their father, and now you've joined the church, you've become a, I mean, how does that, wow, 
There's a lot of heavy stuff going on here. Well, and what an amazing image to see those who are, you know, raging with their weapons of war and slaughtering people all of a sudden look at what they're doing, drop their weapons, and join the other side. To soldiers who may have been fighting alongside of them, pleading for their own life. Yeah, and it says most of the slaughters were done by the Amalekites and Amulonites. So it may be that you may have just killed one person and realized this is horrible. You know, it may not have been a slaughter. I would like to interject a quick anecdote just to give a perspective on this. Many years ago, I helped design a youth conference where we had big battles with foam swords and that kind of thing. But one of the things that I did was created a series of scenarios that the kids did. So we had two armies and then we would do various scripture scenarios. Maybe somebody would be surrounded or they would be the ones surrounding or there'd be an ambush or there'd be, you know, a pretend river of water they'd have to compete with or whatever. So after like 10 scenarios that we ran, the kids were fired up and just, you know, bloodlust. And then I told my group that this next one, we were going to charge and then kneel down and lay down our weapons of war. Now, I told the leader of the other army, who is a fellow that trains policemen, so he knew exactly what to do, and he just got them red with rage. So when I announced to my team of young people that this is what we were going to do, there was this young man that stood up and said, I'd like to lead this charge. And everyone got really sober, and it was awesome to see So they start the charge. He kind of lifts his sword and they all kneel down and lay down their weapons of war. Well, the opposite side was charging so fast that they kind of like fell into this kneeling bunch and looked around shocked and puzzled at this sign of humility. And then they just slaughtered them all. (laughs) Here's the point, though, that I want to make, because they were just getting whacked with foam swords. One of the young women afterwards was talking to one of her leaders and she said, I know this is a game. I know these are just toy swords. I know I'm not going to get hurt. But she said, it was so hard to lay down my sword. And I thought, that's, boy, is that, that's right. You really have to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ to be able to lay down your sword. And it's one reason why we work so hard to try to help all of us participate in and get the gospel inside of us to give us the strength to lay down the swords of our rebellion. But it's not easy. Not at all. Well, we touched on this, but in the next couple of verses, Mormon makes sure that we understand that most of the people doing the slaughtering are Amalekites and Amulonites, most of which were followers of Nehor. So, you know, the fruits of that religion. It just keeps on giving. It does, but not in a good way. No. Those that were converted were actual descendants of Laman and Lemuel. There were no Nehor followers or Amalekites or Amulonites. That one Amalekite convert, I guess that was the only one we got. And that was earlier. So chapter 24 ends with this very powerful summary from Mormon in verse 30. And thus we can plainly discern that after a people have been once enlightened by the Spirit of God and have had great knowledge of things pertaining to righteousness and then have fallen away into sin and transgression, they become more hardened and thus their state becomes worse than though they had never known these things. Boy, isn't that the truth. Well, we're seeing that play out for sure. But good thing that can never happen to any of us. (laughs) There's a great quote that I got from the Institute Manual. This is a great moment in church history that here is being quoted from the teachings of presidents of the church, Joseph Smith Manual. A brother, Isaac Behunin, once told the prophet Joseph Smith, quote, If I should leave this church, I would not do as those men have done. I would go to some remote place where Mormonism had never been heard of Settle down, and no one would ever learn that I knew anything about it. The great seer immediately replied, Brother Behunin, you don't know what you would do. No doubt these men once thought as you do. Before you joined this church, you stood on neutral ground. When the gospel was preached, good and evil were set before you. You could choose either or neither. 
there were two opposite masters inviting you to serve them. When you joined this church, you enlisted to serve God. When you did that, you left the neutral ground, and you never can get back onto it. Should you forsake the master you enlisted to serve, it will be by the instigation of the evil one, and you will follow his dictation and be his servant. End quote. Yeah, very true. Well, and certainly for someone to have said what Brother Rahunan said in this day and age, I would just kind of chuckle because, you know, the church, it's kind of everywhere now. Yes, right. <laughs> well, that's a good point. You can't really... You can't really escape it to any remote places. Well, so this brings us to chapter 25. And chapter 25 is the other side of a story that we've already covered. So please make a note in your scriptures. What happens in 25, the beginning part anyway, is connected to what happened in Alma 16, verses 1 through 11. If I can bring your mind back to Alma and Amulek having preached in Ammonihah, the people of Ammonihah cast out the righteous, burned the women and children who were righteous, uh, and the scriptures and Alma and Amulek left. But the prophecy still hung over that city that the Lamanites would destroy. And they said, there's no way, no way can God destroy this great city. Very shortly after that, an army of the Lamanite comes out of nowhere and destroys the city. In one day. In one day. And where does that Lamanite army come from? Right now in our story is where it comes from. So we saw it from the Nephite side. Now we're going to look at it from the Lamanite side. So what was happening? Well, they attacked their own brethren. Many people joined the church. It was a disaster for those that were wicked who wanted to overthrow the government. And in verse 1, behold, it came to pass that those Lamanites were more angry because they had slain their brethren, therefore they swore vengeance upon the Nephites, and they did no more attempt to slay the people of Anti-Nephi-Lehi at that time, but they took their armies and went over into the borders of the land of Zarahemla and fell upon the people who were in the land of Ammonihah and destroyed them. That's where that army came from. What was happening in the south was this whole battle with the Anti-Nephi-Lehi's, well, if you call it a battle, slaughter. They were so enraged and thought, why are we attacking our own people? and marched up the west coast and came into Ammonihah and destroyed it. But it was really only Ammonihah and a little bit of the lands round about. They captured some people. And then, if you read in chapter 16, Captain Zoram and his two sons, Aha and Lehi, they conquer and scatter and cast out the Lamanite army. What we don't know from that story is the conversion experience that's happening among this Lamanite army. Well, now we get a window into that. Plus, back then, I mentioned that two prophecies were being fulfilled. The prophecy of the destruction of Ammonihah, but the other prophecy that was happening during that time was one that they had waited for for maybe 40 years. And that was the prophecy of Abinadi against the priests of Noah when he was being put to death. And that's what plays out here. This is where we're getting the Lamanite side of this story. So after all that, they had many battles with the Nephites, verse 3, in which they were driven and slain. And among the Lamanites who were slain were almost all the seed of Amulon and his brethren, who were the priests of Noah. And they were slain by the hands of the Nephites. So in verse 5, the remainder fled into the wilderness. So what happens there? Verse 6, many of them, after having suffered much loss and so many afflictions, these are the Lamanites, began to be stirred up in remembrance of the words which Aaron and his brethren had preached to them in the land. Do you remember when Aaron was having no luck and nobody was listening to him? Well, what he did was not in vain. It was not wasted time. All of that effort and suffering, those Lamanites weren't converted then. They weren't converted when they attacked their own brethren. But the Lord used this opportunity for them to be scattered in the wilderness and facing these afflictions, that finally, in their moment of turmoil, they reflect back on these words which Aaron and his brethren had said. It wasn't wasted. They have converts. It just took a while for the seed to grow, but they planted it. It makes you wonder if these Lamanites were from Madonai. And perhaps were responsible for putting Aaron and his brethren into prison. Well, maybe so. Who knows? 
Maybe so. But I love this because it didn't say, you know, they were stirred up in remembrance of the words of the king, Anti-Nephi-Lehi or Lamoni or Ammon. It was specifically Aaron and his brethren. So yeah. therefore, they began to disbelieve the traditions of their fathers and to believe in the Lord and that he gave great power unto the Nephites. And thus there were many of them converted in the wilderness. This was not good news to those who had been leading them and firing them up in rebellion. In verse 7, it came to pass that those rulers who were the remnant of the children of Amulon caused that they should be put to death. Yea, all those who believed in these things. And it said back in verse 5 that they were put to death by fire. And that's exactly what Abinadi prophesied that the descendants of King Noah's priests would do. But there's another part to that prophecy that's going to come true in verse 8. Now, this martyrdom caused that many of their brethren should be stirred up to anger against who? Against the descendants of Amulon. And there began to be contention in the wilderness, and the Lamanites began to hunt the seed of Amulon and his brethren and began to slay them. And they fled into the east wilderness, and behold, they are hunted at this day by the Lamanites. I don't know what this day is, whether it's Mormon's day or... Alma's day, but the bottom line is we never hear of the Amulonites after this again. That's the end of their story in our record. Thus the words of Abinadi were brought to pass. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy, which he said concerning the seed of the priests. So in verses 13 through 17, the Lamanites went home, those that had been converted in the wilderness, and many of them joined the anti-Nephi-Lehi's in Ishmael and Nephi, and they buried their weapons of war, started keeping the law of Moses and looking forward to Christ. Here's what's, what's really cool. All the Nephites, they have no idea. No idea this is happening. All they know is an army of Lamanites came along, they attacked the city, they routed them out, they defeated them and scattered them, and they're gone. And yet God is doing all of this incredible work with them and they have no idea yet. So they will find out soon. They certainly but will. Going on to chapter 26. Welcome to chapter 26. This is a retrospective. This is the sons of Mosiah, largely voiced by Ammon, talking about the success of their mission, talking about their whole mission experience. So this is at the end of their mission, talking about their experience. In verse 1, and now these are the words of Ammon to his brethren, which say thus, My brothers and my brethren, behold, I say unto you, how great reason have we to rejoice. For could we have supposed when we started from the land of Zarahemla that God would have granted unto us such great blessings? And now I ask, what great blessings has he bestowed upon us? Can ye tell? He kind of asked that as a joke. Yeah, he does. <laughs> Behold, I answer for you. For our brethren, the Lamanites, were in darkness, yea, even the darkest abyss. But behold, how many of them are brought to behold the marvelous light of God. And this is the blessing which hath been bestowed upon us, that we have been made instruments in the hands of God to bring about this great work. Behold, thousands of them do rejoice and have been brought into the fold of God. And he goes on for many verses. Oh, he's so excited. He has much to, yeah, well, and he has much to praise. Yeah. They had oh, yeah. an unprecedented experience. Absolutely. There's a little segment that I really enjoy starting in verse 10 where you have Aaron rebuking <laughs> him. And it came to pass that when Ammon had said these words, his brother Aaron rebuked him, saying, Ammon? I fear that thy joy doth carry thee away unto boasting. But Ammon said unto him, I do not boast in my own strength, nor in my own wisdom. But behold, my joy is full. Yea, my heart is brim with joy, and I will rejoice in my God. Yea, I know that I am nothing. As to my strength, I am weak. Therefore, I will not boast of myself, but I will boast of my God. For in his strength I can do all things. Yea, behold, many mighty miracles we have wrought in this land, for which we will praise his name forever. I love him so much. Yeah. 
He uses a unique phrase in verse 16. Ammon says, Behold, who can glory too much in the Lord? <laughs> from the Institute Manual, there's a really great quote from Sister Sherry L. Dew. This is from April 1999 General Conference. She says, quote, Is it possible to be happy when life is hard? To feel peace amid uncertainty and hope in the midst of cynicism? Is it possible to change, to shake off old habits and become new again? Is it possible to live with integrity and purity in a world that no longer values the virtues that distinguish the followers of Christ? Yes. The answer is yes, because of Jesus Christ, whose atonement ensures that we need not bear the burdens of mortality alone. Through the years, I, like you, have experienced pressures and disappointments that would have crushed me had I not been able to draw upon a source of wisdom and strength far greater than my own. He has never forgotten or forsaken me, and I have come to know for myself that Jesus is the Christ and that this is his church. With Ammon, I say, for who can glory too much in the Lord? Yea, who can say too much of his great power and of his mercy? Behold, I cannot say the smallest part which I feel. I testify that in this, the twilight of the dispensation of the fullness of times, when Lucifer is working overtime to jeopardize our journey home and to separate us from the Savior's atoning power, the only answer for any of us is Jesus Christ. End quote. Amen to that. That's great. I love that. So Ammon continues here in verse 17. Who could have supposed that our God would have been so merciful as to have snatched us from our awful, sinful, and polluted state? Behold, we went forth even in wrath with mighty threatenings to destroy his church. Oh, then why did he not consign us to an awful destruction? Yea, why did he not let the sword of his justice fall upon us, and doom us to eternal despair. Oh, my soul almost as it were fleeth at the thought. Behold, he did not exercise his justice upon us, but in his great mercy hath brought us over that everlasting gulf of death and misery, even to the salvation of our souls. And now, behold, my brethren, what natural man is there that knoweth these things? I say unto you, there is none that knoweth these things, save it be the penitent. So good. So important to reflect on where they had come from. We've gone so far from the end of Mosiah, we maybe forgot that these guys were actually <laughs> actively tearing down the church at one point. Well, it brings up such a great point that this is not something the natural man even has the capacity to experience what's it i think it's first corinthians 2 maybe verse 13 or 14 that talks about that that it can't know these things it simply doesn't have the tool set only the penitent and the penitent helps to access well it's through that process of change that we access the spirit through which we can know these things such a good point in verse 23 we talked about this area before already he's talking now the backstory of getting ready to go on their mission. Yeah, this was Alma 17, if we wanted to go back to this is yet right when they're on their way down to the Lamanite lands. He's reflecting back on that. Now, do you remember, my brethren, that we said unto our brethren in the land of Zarahemla, we go up to the land of Nephi to preach unto our brethren, the Lamanites, and they laughed us to scorn? For they said unto us, Do ye suppose ye can bring the Lamanites to the knowledge of the truth? Do you suppose ye can convince the Lamanites of the incorrectness of the traditions of their fathers, as stiff-necked a people as they are, whose hearts delight in the shedding of blood, whose days have been spent in the grossest iniquity, whose ways have been the ways of a transgressor from the beginning? Now, my brethren, ye remember that this was their language. And moreover, did they say, let us take up arms against them, that we destroy them and their iniquity out of the land, lest they overrun us and destroy us. But behold, my beloved brethren, we came into the wilderness 
not with the intent to destroy our brethren, but with the intent that perhaps we might save some few of their souls. Now when our hearts were depressed and we were about to turn back, behold, the Lord comforted us and said, Go amongst thy brethren, the Lamanites, and bear with patience thine afflictions, and I will give unto you success. What an important promise. One of the ways I think they can feel this is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ that had changed their hearts so that they could esteem their enemy as their brethren, whereas the others couldn't see it that way. They saw them as an other, as the Lamanites did to the Nephites. There's no you know, right side to this. They wanted to destroy their enemy as the Lamanites wanted to destroy them. That's a simple response, but it's a divine response to say, let's serve, let's love, let's reach out to and try to save some souls. You know, I wonder if the sons of Mosiah took from that phrase, go amongst thy brethren, the Lamanites, and bear with patience thine afflictions. That's almost a promise from the Lord. Hey, you're going to have problems. Right. Be patient with them. Yeah. Well, and, and as we find out in 17. Good things will come of it. Right. They, he, there's promises associated with that, too. I, I just am really compelled about the attitude they have. And if we're not feeling that, uh, as Alma asks, if you've felt that before, but you're not now, why not? Today, we've got, you know, there's a lot of contention out there, a lot of fear and a lot of frustration, but destroying one another, there's no end to that. There's no good outcome there. The Book of Mormon makes that clear, even, you know, with battles where they're a good cause. They're defending their homes and their families and their religion and all that. But it's not like they have that war and then they're done. You know, that's what the uh, people of Ammon did is about as close as we get to resolving it. I think, how many converts do you normally get in warfare? And yet they got more than were killed. More than a thousand. Yeah. So in verse 28, and now behold, we have come. And been forth amongst them, and we have been patient in our sufferings, and we have suffered every privation. Yea, we have traveled from house to house, relying upon the mercies of the world, not upon the mercies of the world alone, but upon the mercies of God. And we have entered into their houses and taught them, and we have taught them in their streets. Yea, and we have taught them upon their hills, and we have also entered into their temples and their synagogues and taught them. And we have been cast out and mocked and spit upon and smote upon our cheeks. And we have been stoned and taken and bound with strong cords and cast into prison. And through the power and wisdom of God, we have been delivered again. And we have suffered all manner of afflictions and all this that perhaps we might be the means of saving some soul. And we supposed that our joy would be full if perhaps we could be the means of saving some. Now behold, we can look forth and see the fruits of our labors. And are they few? I say unto you, nay, they are many. Yea, and we can witness of their sincerity because of their love towards their brethren and also towards us. This is a significant set of verses for me. This was a set of verses that I reflected on during the closing days of my own mission, and they brought me a great deal of comfort. Now, I can't claim to have as varied an experience as the sons of Mosiah. I certainly didn't have as long a mission as they did, and I didn't suffer every privation, but I suffered some. And I also saw the fruits of my own labor in some degree, and it was remarkable to me and a miracle. Along that same line, from the Institute Manual, we have a quote from Elder F. Burton Howard of the 70s. This is coming from a book called Heroes from the Book of Mormon. He says, quote, I was reading again the 26th chapter of Alma and the story of Ammon's mission. I read out loud, as I sometimes do, trying to put myself in the position of the characters in the book, imagining that I was saying or hearing the words that I was there. Once more... I went over the report, and with a clarity which cannot be described and which would be difficult to comprehend by one who has not experienced it, the Spirit spoke to my soul, saying, 
Did you notice? Everything that happened to Ammon happened to you. It was a totally unexpected sentiment. It was startling in its scope. It was a thought that had never occurred to me before. I quickly reread the story. Yes, there were a few times when my heart had been depressed and I had thought about going home. I too had gone to a foreign land to teach the gospel to the Lamanites. I had gone forth among them, had suffered hardships, had slept on the floor, endured the cold, gone without eating. I, too, had traveled from house to house, knocking on doors for months at a time without being invited in, relying on the mercies of God. There had been other times when we had entered houses and talked to people. We had taught them on their streets and on their hills. We had even preached in other churches. I remembered the time I had been spit upon. I remembered the concern about being hit or injured by those who did not want to hear the message. I remembered spending time in jail while my legal right to be a missionary in a certain country was decided by the police authorities. I remembered enduring these things with the hope that we might be the means of saving some soul. And then on that day as I read, the Spirit testified to me again, and the words remain with me even today. No one but a missionary could have written this story. Joseph Smith could never have known what it was like to be a missionary to the Lamanites, for no one he knew had ever done such a thing before. End quote. Very powerful thought. So then we end the chapter, verse 35. Now, have we not reason to rejoice? Yea, I say unto you, there never were men that had so great reason to rejoice as we, since the world began. Yea, and my joy is carried away even unto boasting in my God, for he has all power, all wisdom, and all understanding. He comprehendeth all things, and he is a merciful being, even unto salvation to those who will repent and believe on his name. Now, if this is boasting, even so will I boast, for this is my life and my light, my joy and my salvation, and my redemption from everlasting woe. Yea, blessed is the name of my God, who has been mindful of this people, who are a branch of the tree of Israel, and has been lost from its body in a strange land. Yea, I say, blessed be the name of my God, who has been mindful of us, wanderers in a strange land. Now, my brethren, we see that God is mindful of every people, whatsoever land they may be in. Yea, he numbereth his people, and his bowels of mercy are over all the earth. Now this is my joy and my great thanksgiving. Yea, and I will give thanks unto my God forever. Amen. I love that guy so much. This has been an amazing mission for yeah. the sons of Mosiah. Well, and they don't know at this point that it's over, but it's coming to a close. That brings us to chapter 27. Now, the beginning of chapter 27 is still a continuation of the very same thing we started in 25. Remember, in 25, we had the army that had been scattered after they destroyed Ammonihah, and they're on their way back. Now, 25 gives us an insight into what the righteous Lamanites did. They came back, they joined the people of God, many of them. But what about the Amalekites? Remember, we've lost the Amulonites now, but the Amalekites are still in power. Well, now let's find out what happened to them. So don't lose track just because we've skipped a chapter. So chapter 16, chapter 25, and chapter 27 are all connected. So, now it came to pass that when those Lamanites who had gone to war, we just talked about that against the Nephites, had found after their many struggles to destroy them that it was in vain to seek their destruction, they returned again to the land of Nephi. It came to pass that the Amalekites, again, the Amulonites are gone, because of their loss were exceedingly angry. And when they saw that they could not seek revenge from the Nephites, they began to stir up the people in anger against their brethren the people of anti-Nephi-Lehi. Therefore, they began again to destroy them. So they started by destroying them. 
They realized, hey, this is stupid. We should go attack the Nephites. That didn't work out. So they're going to come back down here and pick on the people who won't fight back. They got to destroy somebody. They apparently they do. Now, this people again refused to take their arms and they suffered themselves to be slain according to the desires of their enemies. Now, in verse four, Ammon and his brethren can't stand this. Now, when Ammon and his brethren saw this work of destruction among them, among those whom they so dearly beloved and among those who had so dearly beloved them, for they were treated as though they were angels sent from God to save them from everlasting destruction. Therefore, when Ammon and his brethren saw this great work of destruction, they were moved with compassion and they said unto the king, let us gather together this people of the Lord and let us go down to the land of Zarahemla to our people, to our brethren, the Nephites, and flee out of the hands of our enemies that we be not destroyed. Behold, the Nephites will destroy us because of the many murders and sins which we have committed against them. I will go and inquire of the Lord. And if he say unto us, Go down unto our brethren, will ye go? Yea, if the Lord saith unto us, Go, we will go down unto our brethren, and we will be their slaves until we repair unto them the many murders and sins which we have committed against them. It is against the law of our people, which was established by my father, that there should be any slaves among them. Therefore, let us go down and rely upon the mercies of our brethren. Inquire of the Lord, and if he saith unto us, Go, we will go. Otherwise, we will perish in the land. Boy, I tell you, that is faithful. I love that he's waiting for the Lord to say, and he'll do whatever the Lord wants him to do. Well, and he has a solid understanding, too, of his place. He realizes that the Nephites have no reason to be merciful to them. And we'll get more into that later. Yeah, he'll get to know them a little better and (laughs) it might help him. But I still love this guy. And this is King Anti-Nephi-Lehi who we're talking about. So Ammon did go and inquire of the Lord. The Lord said in verse 12, get this people out of this land that they perish not. For Satan has great hold on the hearts of the Amalekites who do stir up the Lamanites to anger against their brethren to slay them. Therefore, get thee out of this land and blessed are this people in this generation, for I will preserve them. So then in the next few verses, uh, Ammon tells the king the words of the Lord. The king says, okay, and the people gather their flocks and belongings to leave their homeland for Zarahemla. And Ammon promises he will go and plead for their people to the Nephites. So he's going to try the hearts of his brethren. And let's see how that turns out. When we get to verse 16, we have now connected the stories. If you'll remember, there was the chapters going on. Uh, Chapter 1 through 16 was happening in the north. We went to 17 in the south up through this moment where the two stories collide. Alma is on his way to Manti to teach, and he bumps into the sons of Mosiah. Look at this greeting. It came to pass, verse 16, it came to pass that as Ammon was going forth into the land, that he and his brethren met Alma over in the place which has been spoken back in chapter 17. And behold, this was a joyful meeting. Now, the joy of Ammon was so great, even that he was full, yea, he was swallowed up in the joy of his God, even to the exhausting of his strength. And he fell again to the earth. Now was not this exceeding joy. Behold, this is joy which none receiveth, save it be the truly penitent and humble seeker of happiness. Now, the joy of Alma in meeting his brethren was truly great, and also the joy of Aaron and Omner and Himni. But behold, their joy was not that to exceed their strength. So... I love these guys. So they get together. Alma, of course, cancels his trip to Manti. They've, this is very important what they need to do. They need to get these people into the land of Zarahemla. So they go back. They talk to the chief judge, who's Nephiha. That's the one that Alma the Younger had given the chief judgeship to back in chapter four. And he calls for a vote, Nephiha does. And the people, the voice of the people is that they can have the whole land of Jershon. And, and this is huge, they will protect them with their armies, which means they will protect them 
with their lives. These people are willing to protect these Lamanites, some of which were part of the group that attacked Ammonihah and that came with the king maybe 10 years ago to try to attack the city of Zarahemla, you know, with the Amlicite, Alma chapter 2. They're all in this group. But the Nephites say, no, not only will we bring them in, but we will protect them with our lives. And all they ask in return is that the people of anti-Nephi-Lehi will help support their armies. This is an incredible display of Christ-like forgiveness. From the Institute Manual, there's a quote from President Howard W. Hunter. This is from October 1992 General Conference. He says, quote, Consider, for example, this instruction from Christ to his disciples. He said, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Think what this admonition alone would do in your neighborhood and mine, and in the communities in which you and your children live, in the nations which make up our great global family. I realize this doctrine poses a significant challenge, but surely it is a more agreeable challenge than the terrible tasks posed for us by the war and poverty and pain the world continues to face. We all have significant opportunity to practice Christianity, and we should try it at every opportunity. For example, we can all be a little more forgiving, end quote. Yeah, and well illustrated in this story. Absolutely. Two enemies coming together in love. So that brings us to chapter 28. Welcome to chapter 28. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How you doing? Let's take a look at what's going to happen. This is huge. The people of anti-Nephi-Lehi are now going to be called the people of Ammon, as they're referred to by the Nephites. Perhaps that was a shorter nickname that was given to them rather than their <laughs> longer name. Yes. We can't relate to that. That longer one didn't Jesus fit Christ on their softball Saints. uniforms, so they it didn't. So. People of Ammon. Did this one. In verse 1, now it came to pass that after the people of Ammon were established in the land of Jershon and a church also established in the land of Jershon and the armies of the Nephites were set round about the land of Jershon, they seem to know already that there is darkness coming. Yea, in all the borders round about the land of Zarahemla, behold, the armies of the Lamanites had followed their brethren into the wilderness. And look at what resulted. Look at what... <laughs> When the Nephites were willing to take them in, I don't think there was even a sense of saying, you know what, they're probably going to be fine. I bet nobody's going to attack them. I think they must have known up front, you guys are in for trouble. And look at how it's described in verse 2. Thus, there was a tremendous battle. Yea, even such an one as never had been known among all the people in the land from the time Lehi left Jerusalem. Yea, and tens of thousands of Lamanites were slain and scattered abroad. Yea, and also there was a tremendous slaughter among the people of Nephi. Nevertheless, the Lamanites were driven and scattered, and the people of Nephi returned again to their land. That was the price the Nephites were willing to pay to protect these people of God. We all work in different ways. The Lord works with us in different ways. There's different roles. For some, it's to bury their weapons of war and bring people to Christ by this love. And for others, it's to defend them and lay down their lives. All of these people were motivated by the same love of God. And it's a beautiful story. It's a very powerful story. And in one verse, in a few sentences, they cover the greatest, most violent war that has ever been in the last 500 plus years. And I just wanted to point that out so that you didn't just skim over that. This was a huge sacrifice. And in verse 7, we learn that this is the end of the 15th year of the reign of the judges. So this was a busy year. Wow. There was a lot that went on there. The destruction of Ammonihah, the migration of the anti-Nephi-Lehi's to Zarahemla, the meeting of Alma and the sons of Mosiah. And the biggest big war year. that's ever been seen. 
So in the last few verses of chapter 28, Mormon takes a moment to summarize (laughs) these first 15 years of the reign of the judges. Verse 10, And from the first year to the 15th has brought to pass the destruction of many thousand lives. Yea, it has brought to pass an awful scene of bloodshed. And the bodies of many thousands are laid low in the earth, while the bodies of many thousands are moldering in heaps upon the face of the earth. Yea, and many thousands are mourning for the loss of their kindred, because they have reason to fear, according to the promises of the Lord, that they are consigned to a state of endless woe while many thousands of others truly mourn for the loss of their kindred. Yet they rejoice and exult in the hope and even know, according to the promises of the Lord, that they are raised to dwell at the right hand of God in a state of never-ending happiness. And thus we see how great the inequality of man is because of sin and transgression and the power of the devil, which comes by the cunning plans which he hath devised to ensnare the hearts of men. And thus we see the great call of diligence of men to labor in the vineyards of the Lord. And thus we see the great reason of sorrow and also of rejoicing, sorrow because of death and destruction among men, and joy because of the light of Christ unto life. That's a great That's really summary. something. It really Um, is. And this has obviously been a very meaningful story for Mormon. Yeah, and for us too, I think. Absolutely. So Alma 29, where in Alma 26, we had Ammon praising the glory of his God and the wonderfulness of his mission, which, by the way, one of the things I wanted to mention is that when the sons of Mosiah and Alma meet up, it's possible that the sons of Mosiah didn't know that Alma was appointed to be head of the church. They might have left before that. Oh, yeah. And so that would have been certainly an amazing discovery for them to know that, hey, not only had he been the chief priest or the high priest, but he'd also been the chief judge. And obviously one who had a very influential place in Nephite society at that time. And so, sure, yeah, he was going to come and join them and help ease the Concerns of the Nephites as they bring this group of Lamanites in. Can you imagine the stories that they would share? Man, the walk back to Zarahemla (laughs) must have just been riveting as they shared stories back and forth and found those same connections we're finding. You know, oh, you battled with the king of the Lamanites? Hey, I converted him to the gospel. Well, (laughs) Aaron, you know, can you imagine Alma finding out that the king that he battled at the waters of the Sidon in chapter 2 of Alma ended up joining the church? Must have been awesome. How amazing is that? Yep. So here we have what is sometimes called the Psalm of Alma in chapter 29. Oh, that I were an angel and could have the wish of mine heart that I might go forth and speak with the trump of God with a voice to shake the earth and cry repentance unto every people. Yea, I would declare unto every soul as with the voice of thunder, repentance, and the plan of redemption, that they should repent and come unto God, that there might not be more sorrow upon all the face of the earth. What's wrong with that? Well, what's interesting is that he's kind of coming from firsthand experience, right? Yeah. He certainly has seen an angel shake the earth, so he knows. Yeah, I'd like to be like that. Verse 3, but behold... I am a man and do sin in my wish, for I ought to be content with the things which the Lord hath allotted unto me. I ought not to harrow up in my desires the firm decree of a just God, for I know that he granteth unto men according to their desire, whether it be unto death or unto life. So wait, I could choose life? Or death? You could. I choose life. You could choose life. I will choose life. Yea, I know that he allotteth unto men, yea, decreeth unto them decrees which are unalterable according to their wills, whether they be unto salvation or unto destruction. So here very clearly, if you want salvation or you want destruction, that's on you. What is your will? 
What is your desire? From the Institute Manual, we have a quote from Neil A. Maxwell, Elder Neil A. Maxwell. This is from October 1996 General Conference. Quote, Desires become real determinants, even when with pitiful naivete, we do not really want the consequences of our desires. Therefore, what we insistently desire over time is what we will eventually become and what we will receive in eternity. Righteous desires need to be relentless. Therefore, because, said President Brigham Young, the men and women who desire to obtain seats in the celestial kingdom will find that they must battle every day. Therefore, true Christian soldiers are more than weekend warriors. Remember, brothers and sisters, it is our own desires which determine the sizing and the attractiveness of various temptations. We set our thermostats as to temptations. Thus, educating and training our desires clearly requires understanding the truths of the gospel. Yet even more is involved. President Brigham Young confirmed, saying, It is evident that many who understand the truth do not govern themselves by it. Consequently, no matter how true and beautiful truth is, you have to take the passions of the people and mold them to the law of God. Only by educating and training our desires can they become our allies instead of our enemies. Oh, that's quote. good. And agency is all over that. Oh, yeah. You know, which wolf do we feed? Exactly. So going on, verse 10, And behold, when I see the many of my brethren truly penitent and coming to the Lord their God, then is my soul filled with joy. Then do I remember. Remember that word? Uh Then do I remember what the Lord has done for me. Yea, even that he hath heard my prayer. Yea, then do I remember his merciful arm which he extended towards me. Yea, and I also remember the captivity of my fathers, for I surely do know that the Lord did deliver them out of bondage, and by this did establish his church. Yea, the Lord God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, And the God of Jacob did deliver them out of bondage. Yea, I have always remembered the captivity of my fathers, and that same God who delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians did deliver them out of bondage. Yea, and that same God did establish his church among them. Yea, and that same God hath called me by a holy calling to preach the word unto this people, and hath given me much success in the which my joy is full. You know what I like about this set of rememberings is that in the past, we've seen them as a challenge to others who are struggling spiritually. But here he's testifying of his remembering of the captivity of his fathers and other things and what joy it brings him, how it helps him. So we're getting the other side of that remembering in his comments. And notice that he is remembering the blessings of the Lord. He's not saying, and I remember that the angel told me that if I will of myself be destroyed, I better stop destroying the church. That was a thing, certainly. But he's remembering the merciful arm which the Lord extended toward him. Yeah. And remembering the captivity of his fathers. But in as much as the deliverance, right, the deliverance is connected with that. It's God who delivered them. Right. Oh, that's wonderful. So finishing up, verse 16. Now, when I think of the success of these, my brethren, my soul is carried away, even to the separation of it from the body, as it were. So great is my joy. And now may God grant unto these, my brethren, that they may sit down in the kingdom of God, yea, and also all those who are the fruit of their labors, that they may go no more out, but that they may praise him forever. And may God grant that it may be done according to my words, even as I have spoken. Amen. Thank you, Alma. What a wonderful testimony. So 
as we've wrapped up these chapters, I thought I'd offer an invitation. Did you find a gem? Did you hold up the scriptures in a different way as we've explored them and found something new? Would you share it with somebody? And you don't have to say you even got it from this show. Remember, once you've discovered it, now it's yours. It's your discovery. So share it with somebody, a family member, a friend on social media. Share something you discovered in your scripture study this week, whether it's from our show or not. Just share it and the Lord will bless you. So as my brother always says, make sure you're reading your scriptures and we will see you next time. I do always say that. See you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we're really big fans.